Okay, it is 11.55, so we're going to get started. Um, thank you all for joining me today on day three. I don't know about you, but it kind of feels like day five. Uh, <laughs> it's been a really, it's been really good, great conference, but really like packed full of stuff and great conversations, great content, and I'm feeling it, so stick with me. This might be a little bit more rambly than I usually like, um, but I'm here to talk about kind of a hard problem that I'm assuming many of us in the room have struggled with in the past, which is how we think about and define the value of open source work. My name is Sophia Vargas. I am currently a researcher and analyst in Google's Open Source Programs Office. Um, my official title is Program Manager, but I take, tend to take on a lot of research and analytical tasks in support of open source operations, both inside and outside of Google. I'm also an active member of the Chaos community, where we talk about metrics, we define metrics, we use metrics, um, we try to improve the way that we understand things like project and community health. So when we are defining the value of open source work, who is we? Um, this is incredibly subjective and context dependent. Um, so as much as possible, whenever I'm talking about any of these examples, I'm going to try to frame it around an individual, a stakeholder, a persona, some sort of grounding thing, because if we don't, we're just going to keep expanding our problem and making it more complex. So in this case, maybe we'll focus on two primary stakeholders thinking about projects themselves, how they're thinking about defining their own value, as well as companies and organizations thinking about how they both consume and contribute to open source and the value that they get from participating and engaging in these spaces. So the kinds of questions that I've been thinking a lot about when it comes to value are how do projects think about, think about their own impact, the contribution that I have and what impact that has on the project, um, what value does my project have for users, for organizations. It would be great to know these sorts of things if you're thinking about, well, should I keep maintaining my project? <laughs> Um, if you're an organization, you're thinking potentially a lot about how you get value from open source work, both in the way that you consume it as well as the way that you contribute to it. Maybe you're thinking more individually about your organization's impact on the ecosystem um, or the impact that your contribution has to a particular project or an ecosystem. I have to think about what value means too, because when we talked about we and different types of personas, well, we're also thinking about they experience value or expecting value in very different ways. Um, here's a piece of research that the Linux Foundation funded a few years ago, um, I guess a year ago, um, that was asking organizations to describe the benefits that they received from using and or contributing to open source software. And you can see there's a pretty wide range of stuff. Maybe you see cost savings toward the top as well as faster development speed, um, a community to exchange information and knowledge, um, open standards and interoperability, um, reason to work for that company. There's a, a lot of different reasons that organizations could be interested in participating in these spaces. And that's just the organizational persona. What about the individual? Totally different set of things, totally different set of motivations and reasons why they might want to engage in this space. Um, particularly toward the top, I want to develop and improve my skills. I want to learn. I want to engage with the community. I'm intellectually stimulated by writing code. I have fun writing programs. I want to share knowledge and skills. As an individual who participates in open source, these really, I feel them personally. I started working at open source because, well, I was in the open source programs office and it would be really helpful to understand the thing you're researching by participating directly in the thing. And then it turns out it was really fun. I met a lot of amazing people that were thinking about the same problems that I was um, and that I was able to basically work with that community, grow with that community, and continue to learn from that community, um, especially in regards to, say, something like running an OSPO. It is different for every organization, and so hearing how others are struggling through the same problems that I am personally has been an incredible resource. Um, I want to call out um, a presentation that uh, a former colleague of mine, Bob Kellen, gave at Paris KubeCon earlier this year, which is actually a lot about the same topic. And I love the title, Why is this so hard? <laughs> because it is really hard to articulate the value of open source software. And I highly recommend going back and, and reviewing this talk. Um, for this particular example, Bob focused a lot on the individual contributor and maintainer, helping them to, to find the data that they would need and the story they need to tell to convince their stakeholders, say their managers, why they should be working or continue to work on open source. And I really like his talk because it went really into the weeds and the specific details and examples of an individual working on a project and how they might even articulate what that means to their organization. So in a time that we see increasingly constrained resources, when we knew intrinsically a lot of these values because we participate in them, we see them, and we can describe them to others, 
that's not going as far as it used to. We need to start showing people the data in order to back up these reasons why. And this is really hard, again. Um, so I've been struggling with this, working in an OSPO, trying to help projects explain to the management chain or their new manager why they want to keep working on them, why they keep wanting to publish them, and why we want to keep contributing to them. So I was looking for inspiration from other valuation models. This isn't the first time in history that an individual has had to justify their work and explain the value. And so can we borrow from existing models um, and describe the work that we do in open source to others around us? Because I'm talking about OSPOs predominantly, um, I want to start that around businesses and business models. OSPOs typically sit inside businesses, also in other types of organizations. Um, but what are the models and language that the business wants to hear? Things like total cost of ownership. This could sound really boring, but actually I find it as a helpful cost model because a lot of people think about open source consumption and they think about the acquisition cost. They don't think about the ongoing cost. And typically a total cost of ownership model is going to take place over the course of years. So when I, back in the early days when I was a consultant, I used to build these models for data center investments over the scope of 15 years. That's a very long time. But when you think about the lifetime of a data center um, and the equipment and life cycle in it, it is a very long time. And you have to think about the investments that you make over time in both people and infrastructure and tooling and services. Um, and it's both, the, again, the direct and indirect cost to maintain the thing over time. ROI is probably the most popular one. I'm just curious in the room, has anyone tried to put open source into an ROI model? <laughs> a couple of you, yeah. It, it's terrible. Um, and, and there's a few reasons for that. But this is the model that I've been asked to do a lot. And this is really challenging because, okay, in general, it makes sense. How much benefit are we getting, say, in the form of income or net income um, compares to investment over time? And I like to think of investment more, again, in that total cost of ownership model. It's not a one-time acquisition cost. It's an investment over time. But figuring out what net income means for your organization is very challenging. <laughs> Um, and incredibly context specific. So the times that I've seen this work better inside the organization is when an individual project has really dug into what they do, how it connects to the business model, and how they can demonstrate that the work that they do is contributing to that product, that project, that service that is in fact generating money for the organization. But this gets complex because every time you look at it, every project is going to look a little bit different. Something's a language, something's a tool, something's a utility. These are very different things. They serve different purposes. And what if you only use one component of the project versus the whole project? Or what if you give money to the foundation and not the individual project? Or what if you just contribute to one repo and not the entire project? So if you think about the value that you get out of a project and the contribution that you put into a project, it's not always one-to-one. -one. It's not always the whole thing. In fact, it's often part of the thing. Um, and I don't quite know how you break that up unless you investigate deeply and understand the individual context of that one project. And not only is it context specific and subjective within the project, it's also organizationally subjective in terms of where it's used, who it's used by. Um, and sometimes you have to go down a long list of interviews inside your organization and say, hey, I saw you imported this package. What are you doing with it? Are you still using it? Because it's still listed in our uh, registry, but I don't know if anyone's actually calling it anymore. Um, and so sometimes you have to do a little bit of digging to see, again, how these things are used, how they're currently being used, and how they may or may not still be providing value to that one individual case. Um, there's also the inherent challenge where people assume that open source is free. We saw cost savings toward the top of the list. And yes, it is cheaper uh, than buying some software, but it's generally not free. And this is something that I've been thinking a lot about lately, which is the, again, ongoing investment that we make in open source software that we're just using. Even if we're not contributing back to the upstream project, inside your organization, someone is responsible for ensuring that you're using the most up-to-date package. And maybe that's a, a few button clicks and maybe an hour every other month or every other uh, quarter or so. But what, what if it's bigger than that? What if you break something and you have to go downstream uh, and submit additional changes to ensure that that updated package didn't just break an entire project or line of service? So that maintenance cost can start small, but over time and say over thousands of projects that you've imported over the last 10 years, now we're talking about a significant maintenance burden. And so the cost to maintain and invest in, even if you consumed it for free initially, is not free over the long haul. And that assumes, again, that you're not even contributing back. If you're putting people back in the community to fix bugs, to resolve issues, now you're investing even more time and energy and money into that project. So when we think about ROI, and again, the comparison between net benefit and 
investment, I think it's a little bit easier to think about the investment piece, um, whereas the benefit and net income is incredibly challenging. Um, and this is usually where we this, this sort of effort falls down. Um, and then again, the added complexity of what if you use and or contribute to many projects? I work at Google. We consume thousands of projects. We contribute to thousands of projects. Um, and none of them look the same. So again, when I've worked on these types of initiatives internally, it, it's helpful to either focus really narrow or just honestly focus really broad. And it's really hard to do anything in the middle because these efforts typically don't translate on case over case. So something that might help ground you with this exercise, if someone tries to make you do this, and I'm, I'm sorry, I feel your pain, um, is to really understand, first off, what the company's expecting. What kind of value do they want to get out of this? Um, and I always come back, because I feel like Don has said this multiple times, know what's important to your business, know what's important to your stakeholders, and make sure that you're actually demonstrating this value in line with what they expect. Um, and so some, this, something can be helpful is touching base with those individuals, maybe through surveys, maybe through prior examples. Find other ways that you can get a better sense of what they want to hear from this, and then you can expand the review and show them all the other ways that they're benefiting from upstream resolution of issues and bugs that you're now just getting for the cost of, of the original cost. Um, I'm also thinking more about how we can look at open source consumption and contribution as a portfolio. Because again, if we get lost in the weeds of any individual project, this just becomes an increasingly deep rabbit hole. Um, but maybe if we think more aggregately, if we could know all the things that we use, and we could know how much of that that represents of our entire portfolio, then we can compare it to known things. How much money do we spend on proprietary software? How much money do we spend on paid software? Um, and then how much other things go into that? And then compare that with our open source portfolio. And maybe this is challenging to do for some. Um, you have to actually know what you're using and how many people are contributing to those projects, um, which if you don't have, this is kind of a non-starter. Um, but it could be a way to at least put this problem into scale um, for, for your organization that might not be thinking about it. So speaking of open source software projects um, and thinking about other types of valuation models, we can go deep into what it actually means to build the project. And there are a fair amount of software development models that have existed over time that have looked at the cost to develop software. Has anyone heard of Kokomo? Ooh, some, 1981. So I assume you, you've been around for a while. I apologize for making that assumption. Um, this model is designed to, ooh, Excuse me, I knew that was going to happen. Uh, estimate the person month time to get from zero to state of code base and was proposed in 1981 and had a couple of iterations and updates from that initial proposal. Um, oh, that's a spoiler, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, do you think anyone's using this project? Um, to help estimate the cost and spoiler, yes. Um, the Kubernetes community, and I actually was struggling to find the date of which when this was done, um, but someone tried to apply Kokomo to Kubernetes as a way to demonstrate the amount of work that was done to create this project. Um, so I applaud them, and I was also kind of surprised by this because I've asked other researchers what they think of Kokomo, and I either got, huh, what is that? Or like, nobody uses that anymore. <laughs> so I was like, hey, wait, what did they do? Um, so. I like to take inspiration from these types of things and see what we can learn from them and see how we can improve them. So we dig more into what does Kokomo do and how is it structured and what is the structure we can take away from it. The primary key variable of it is lines of code um, as a source of what did, how much did I do and that general quantity. But in addition to lines of code, it's also looking at task complexity. So if you look at the original paper on Kokomo, it outlines in painstaking details different types of tasks that can happen in a software development process and practice, and then associates specific complexity variables to them, like a quantitative number, 1.2, and you multiply that times the other metrics that are being used to com compute this value. Um, and in future iterations of this, or the intermediate model, and then Kokomo 2, they keep adding to this by adding additional contextual multipliers around product hardware, personal experience and skill set, product attributes, or even if this is being reused or readapted code. So an interesting idea, um, again, this was designed in 1981, and I have a feeling that software development practices have changed since then, maybe. Um, and one of the biggest problems with it, which I don't think Bob Kellen is in the room, but I'm quoting him a lot today, so sorry, Bob. Um, we were chatting about this model maybe six months ago, and he was like, it doesn't include history or diffs which is a huge problem. Because if you look at a number of lines of code base in a project, 
that's probably changing over time. And if you say refactor it, it can get smaller. So by Kokomo, it's now, it takes less time to do. In reality, you spent twice as much time because you were refactoring it. Um, and so that's potentially a fairly misleading metric as of lines of code in general, where it's based on this idea that that is the only product that it's stagnant versus over time, you're gonna put effort into improving it and potentially even shortening it. And that could change the way that it's valued or in this terms of model in terms of how long it takes. So um, another model that I want to talk a little about is Dora. This was a research effort within Google, um, where this was acquired by Google, that was looking at developer productivity assessments. Um, it proposed a few methods to measure the effectiveness of software development teams. Um, and I'll get into why I'm expressing that later. Um, but what one part of it that I really liked, and maybe because I have a little bit of a, a metrics obsession, is that their 2020 report was focusing on four key metrics to assess software development performance. Say how quickly you're deploying things and the cadence of your and frequency of deployment. How long does it take for you to change things? How many times do things fail after you change them? And how long does it take you to restore the service after that? And again, these were designed for software development teams inside of companies, but there are a lot of similar metrics that we can use within open source communities that we probably are, might be already using in open source communities, like how responsive are our maintainers? How long does it take for us to address things? Um, how many issues are created after a launch or a release um, that could potentially suggest that this was maybe buggier than in times before? Um, Again, a little chaos bias here, but I love looking at how other people have chose metrics in order to describe things that we all do. Um, so what I like and dislike about Dora is that I think it provides us another way to look at software development around quality versus quantity, where Cocoa was very much focused on lines of code and the quantity created. This is, again, there's still quantifiable metrics, but they're looking at relative quality. If you're looking at release frequency, and that's going down over time versus going up over time, now you're looking at more relative assessments. Um, and so, again, quality is really hard to measure with these types of things, but this can give you some sort of at least relational measurement. Um, and you compare that between projects, between upstream or even with inside your company. Um, the inherent challenge with Dora is that this methodology was designed for teams working at companies. And that's a problem because it assumes more homogeny in people, in composition, in incentive, in motivation, in training, in time commitment, things that are incredibly variable in open source spaces. So again, large grain of salt here, but an interesting idea of how we could potentially look at quality qualitative assessments and compare between projects, which is sort of the, the highlight I want to bring back to this. So what are we learning from these software development productivity models? I think they can be a great way to start inspiring relative measurements. Um, maybe this is, again, my obsession as an analyst and a researcher, but a number by itself doesn't really mean anything. You need to look at what that number means over time. Is it changing? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? What does it look like over here? What does it look like in a community that's half the size, that's twice the size? So you have an understanding of baselines, of trends, of motion, and momentum and movement. Um, so these can be inspirations, but they cannot be used alone. Um, so for something like Kokomo, that's looking at value created per time, we can look at lines of code potentially as some sort of relative comparison with complexity measures. We probably want to add time spent on maintenance and improvement. Um, and something I actually really like is coming back to the lines of code metric. This is a fairly controversial metric because, again, it's not really telling us much because it isn't showing us any history. But if you look at pull requests and the entire payload revolved in the pull request event AP, for the event API, it'll show you lines added and lines removed. So instead of looking at total lines of code, you can look at lines added and removed over time. And I've actually found that to be a much more helpful measurement, measurement in investigating the state of a project because it can tell me, is this project code fairly stable? No one's really making a lot of additions or redactions from this particular code base. Or is, it, is there going through a lot of deletions and revisions over time? And that can kind of tell you how much churn is going on in that code base, but also give you a sense of how much, again, refactoring is happening. So, You'll have to find the way that you want to measure that, but still, again, starting from that lines of code, there are ways to adapt that measurement to take in diff and change over time and find a way to associate some sort of time value to that. Um, and then thinking about Dora and other types of project health metrics, this gives you another relative comparison that's more qualitative with a quantitative backing um, and potentially looking at Again, if you're looking at it over time, you can ask the question, what did I, I, I did this, 
how did the project change? Um, my project did this. My internal company did this. What's the difference between them? I've had some interesting cases where people have reported that their up the upstream project is actually releasing things faster than the internal versions of things. <laughs> What's going on there? That's sort of that's an interesting qualitative assessment of difference between these two spaces and potentially more to investigate on why. So we spend a lot of time talking about software development, and we all know there's a lot more that goes on in open source communities that we need to take into account. Um, so here I'm going to look more at social and social technical models. Social, the social technical model definition is a bit of a mouthful, so I just copied and pasted it. Um, but for those who aren't familiar with the concept of social technical interaction networks, or STINs for short, um, they describe a heterogeneous grouping of things from people, equipment, data, resources, documents, messages, legal, enforcement, resource flows. Honestly, this list is kind of a hodgepodge of random stuff, but that's kind of the point. Um, and social technical networks look at that network relationship between these elements and assume that there is some sort of interaction, interplay that happens, which we, we know to be true. And so the earliest record and reference to open source in this model I found was in 2003. Maybe there's an earlier one, but this is the first one that I found. Applying this model to open source because there is a lot of complexity in this process and a lot of different types of pieces and resources and motivations and components that are coming together to perform loosely coordinated software development uh, between developers and contributors. Um, another model I want to consider on the social side is an idea proposed by Julia Ferrioli a couple of years ago where she wrote out this, this piece on, on lead dev describing the fact that we don't, a fact we don't really think about a lot, which is that open source projects are not all designed to be collaborative. There are many reasons why you could open source something. Uh, it could be because you want to release your demo code. Um, it could be because you want to share a proof of concept and educate others that are trying to do the same thing. So it could also be validation, facilitation, experimentation. There are many reasons why we choose to share the work that we do, because it can benefit someone in some way, but you don't necessarily expect that it's going to become a full-blown community-driven project. Um, granted, the in creator, content, creator intent doesn't necessarily mean that's how people are going to use it, but maybe we should be considering this before we adopt something. If it's just a proof of concept code, it's probably not going to be maintained. I'm actually really curious to hear the, the next talk right after me, which is around um, op uh, open source in academia, because if you think a lot about the things that academics have created, I was having a conversation earlier this week with someone where they had proposed a really cool model, but they had no intention of maintaining that software because they had done it for an academic paper and their dissertation and then they graduated and they're like, I'm going to do this now. <laughs> so it was a really cool idea, but it didn't actually get continued development or, and or interest. Well, the question that I have reviewing this is that can we accurately value projects if we don't actually know why they exist? This is a bit existential and really hard to do. It's just a thought that occurred to me while I was doing this research project. So what can we learn from social technical interaction networks? For me, they provide more variables. And this, again, might be only making your problem larger. But I think when, when we approach these types of discussions, we have to provide more context because open source is more complex. And we try to narrow it down to one number, we're most likely going to miss something. Um, and so maybe you provide a number, but then you have a whole bunch of why and about that could include things like the variety of people, organizations, skills, motivations, and incentives that are at play, or the various types of infrastructure, tools, and resources, and where they came from, and who provided them. Um, I also like to think a lot about the asset that you're creating. We've been focusing a lot on software development examples. I work on a project, Chaos, that does create software. It also creates metrics. It also creates best practices. It also brings people together in functional working groups to talk through problems. This is another kind of resource and asset that isn't always software. And it's kind of amazing that open source can still facilitate these types of interactions. And the benefit and value and assets we get from them aren't always software. The last set group of models that I want to evaluate for this conversation are economic models. And I will caveat this conversation with I took Econ 101 in college more than a decade ago. So <laughs> I remember some things. I don't remember things deeply. And so if there are others in the room that know this more, uh, I apologize for getting things wrong. But I think we can't talk about valuation without talking about economics, because this was maybe the original way to look at how we value things. Um, gross domestic product. This is kind of a controversial, at least for me personally, controversial metric given how it was designed and how it's used. But in general, it provides a monetary measure of market value of final goods and services produced. 
So you might think, why am I talking about GDP? Well, if anyone remembers the keynote, I think yesterday, um, the EU has actually created a number of reports that are looking at open source contributions and their contribution to GDP. So we actually are seeing GDP being applied to open source contexts. Granted, it is at the EU level, so massive size. This is an individual organization. This is an entire group of countries. Um, but they are able to do this somehow and create a number and maybe make a case for maybe government level policies, which they have, or individual country level investments. And so we do see this, this number and this valuation helping in those types of conversations. Because I had to know and look at the methodology, how did they do this? Um, they ended up reviewing at least this particular iteration. I think there was a new one, and I haven't read that one yet. And 2022 was calculated based on publicly known investments and measures, um, as well as a survey of 900 companies. Um, so clearly, this was expensive to do and potentially very difficult for any one individual to do. But maybe at that level, you can get a little bit more funding and support if you have a specific use case. And our most probably stereotypical economic valuation, supply and demand, a concept designed to derive unit price for a particular good or service, traded in a perfectly competitive market with quantity demanded equaling the quantity supplied. That's a paraphrased version of what's written here. But I wanted to highlight all the words that are innately at odds with open source and that things aren't really there with a cost or a price associated with them. Um, Yes, there's competition in open source, but it's not traditionally market competition. We see all different kinds of competition. We see multiple ideas happening. We see people moving between projects, but then we also see examples like Otel, where two projects came together. There were two projects on the same foundation working on very similar things and realized at a certain point, wait, why are we doing this in two separate spaces? We can combine our efforts and do something together. That, that's an incredible feat inside the open source community, but also like, I don't say anti-competitive, but clearly something else, not a truly a traditionally competitive market. Um, and at the end of the day, demand and supply, we like to think that they're interacting with each other, but because again, we often don't know who's using our software, it's really hard to answer that. So I'm curious how others have approached using supply and demand in open source context. The paper that everyone's talking about is came out of Harvard from Frank Nagel, looks at applying the concepts of supply and demand to open source, specifically defining supply as the cost to create and demand as the cost to replace. Again, this is paraphrasing a 12-page article, so if you have different interpretations, I'd love to hear them from it, um, but I like to put them in those contexts. The paper does acknowledge that it's really difficult to do this because of the non-pecuniary nature of open source and lack of centralized tracking, but again, it attempts to put some numbers on a fairly, fairly complex complex thing at a fairly large scale. What can we learn from this exercise? Um, noting that they're defining value as development labor, if you read closely into it, they're defining it as lines of code. And we already talked about the challenges of looking at value created as lines of code. Um, it's not including other types of value. So we originally were thinking about all those other business values and all those other personal values that people are getting by contributing and interacting with these spaces. So that's not included. As well as non-development costs. So maintenance, non-code work, resources. There are so many other things that go into the creation and production of open source software versus an individual developer writing code alone on their laptop. And granted, that does happen too. It's just there's more variety, there's more context. Um, so it's interesting to see that line of code still being served as the primary quantitative measure. Again, we know the challenges with that. Um, and so I'd love to see that adapted in the future. Another model that I wanna share, um, and I mentioned this in my talk yesterday, and here I actually have the link, so if you were there, Here's the actual article um, that I'm referencing um, called Under Production and Approach for Measuring Risk in Open Source Software. So this particular model also looks at supply and demand, but in this case, they're looking at the supply of engineering labor and the demand of people who use the software. Um, this project was based on data from the Debian community that relies on a tool called PopCon, the popularity context, which is a package that can be used to assess all the Debian packages you currently have running and the files that they have accessed in the last week, and you can share that report back with Debian. This is based on an opt-in basis. So you look at it, you decide whether you want to share it, things are anonymized in the process, but it can give the Debian community some feedback on how, how many things are being used or what's still being used, what versions are still being used in the community. So they have some feedback. And it's also given way to research papers like this that are evaluating whether or not projects that are currently used by a lot of people 
do they have adequate production support and maintenance happening in those communities to represent the amount of demand that they face? And so in this particular article, they propose this the re or the reimagining of supply and demand as production and underproduction according to how much people are using this. So I really like that it focuses supply not on cost to create, but on cost to maintain and ongoing maintenance used by these software components. In this case, demand is defined as usage um, because they were able to derive usage again from the PopCon project within Debian. Uh, the paper also acknowledges uh, a lot of nuances and complexities that can't necessarily be unraveled by just looking at these two metrics, including this collaborative effort of volunteers that choose their own priorities and their own tasks. So even if you say we're to increase the maintenance support, say add more people to the project, are they going to work on the things you want them to work on? Maybe. <laughs> Can't really guarantee that. So again, it's not going to necessarily operate in a traditional supply and demand model, but maybe we should be taking these things into considera consideration, especially as an evaluation of risk. So um, in summary, economic models may sway investors, might give you a better idea around risk, but I, I see them as less applicable to individual organizations. I think it's worthwhile following these examples because I think we can continue to learn from them. But outside of the under an overproduction metaphor that could potentially hide, like reveal risk and guide investment, um, the rest are focused a little bit too high level, I would think, for an individual organization. So now that we've gone through a whole bunch of examples, what are we still missing? Is there something coming around the corner that we just haven't thought about yet? One of the major open questions, and again, I, I, I lament the order of my talks because I talked about this yesterday. So if you can go back in time and watch that talk, I suggest it. Um, but we, a lot of us wonder how many people are using our project. It's a basic question that could be attributed to value. If I have a thousand users, then clearly somebody values my work. Somebody's continuing to use my work over time. But it's really hard to do that without embedded telemetry. Um, and so Georg and I from the chaos community have been thinking a lot about ways that we can learn from our user community and usage around our projects through the metrics that we already have from other types of project health metrics that are capturing contributor information alongside user information. So we wrote an article first uh, published in opensource.com that sort of describes a number of ideas that you can sort of see user activity alongside contributor activity baked in things like who's generating issues in your project and what kind of questions they have, what kind of questions are being posed on Stack Overflow, how many people are signing up for your mailing list, and these types of indirect metrics that can also reveal something about your users as well as your other community members. In addition to that, we actually tested some of these metrics against real live usage data in a project, uh, particularly Flutter, and we were able to publish that in a conference earlier this year. So if you're curious, I recommend going to the link, reading our paper, and potentially watching my talk from yesterday whenever it shows up. Um, additionally, I've seen some really interesting talks from others about this topic. Um, one that comes to mind was earlier this year at FOSDEM, an individual proposed a model to ensure that you're embedding privacy at the core of any of your telemetry models. Um, this was a really interesting talk because this individual pr proposed, I want to say like 10 different methods of how to do this because people are really sensitive about privacy. And so knowing that things like IP addresses are, are potentially too much information or even the amount of times that you're accessing something could reveal who that individual is or more about that individual than they want. Um, they take into account a lot of these different attributes as well as ways that you can ensure that you're scraping data in the right places or make sure that you're capping measurements at the right time so you're not overcounting people even if you're doing it in an anonymous setting. Um, and so it was a really interesting talk. Again, this is a fairly contentious thing. So if you do want to add any sort of telemetry to your project, I I highly recommend doing it completely transparently and in conversation with your broader community members because you don't want to upset the people that you're trying to support. Um, there's also more tooling happening. Um, SCARF has been a new tool emerging. I'm really curious to see how that's being used and what value that can be derived from this tool. Um, and clearly, you can also write your own telemetry solution. Um, fun fact, uh, Chaos will be looking into using SCARF, and hopefully we'll have some more data on what that means for us and what we can learn from, those, uh, from that data set as a potential resource for us. Additionally, we mentioned this a little bit, um, but not enough in my opinion, which is a lot of these metrics, again, center around software development and software production. And there's a lot of other work uh, that happens around open source communities. 
And this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone in your business, because if you're in a company and you're writing software, you also have legal teams, you also have finance teams, you also have operational teams and infrastructure teams that are all going into the support of your open, of your software product. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that open source communities need all those resources too. And in fact, those are often provided maybe by the same people, um, but from a variety of volunteers at different times, at different levels. Um, but there's a lot of other work there. And I've been really searching for any research that can give me some sort of, if you think about it, like a complexity variable. If I know X number of people are writing code for the project, how many additional people and or time do I need to really manage my community to my software project. Um, and I know that it's not just, if it could be just one person and that poor person is probably losing it or only choosing to do one of these things. But in reality for successful projects, there's other kinds of support. Um, but I haven't seen any sort of repeatable metric that we can just add. So this is something that you might have to do a little bit more digging and if you want, want to attribute it in any of your models, if not, it's worth at least mentioning. At the end of the day, this is still hard. And I'm sorry, I wanted to have more of a better conclusion and say, this is the model you should use. These are the variables you should plug in. Um, but there's so much context and so much subjectivity here that it's going to be hard. It's going to be bespoke. Um, and it's going to be a slog every time. Um, I hope to be able to share some of these approaches that we've done. I, I've done within my own work. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to do that yet. But at least if we do that, we can hopefully learn from each other, learn what works better, what moments worse. Um, and always remember to explain your context because it is going to be unique for everyone. Um, I like to think that data is my friend. Um, it's not always your friend, honestly. But if you know how to use it well, you can. You can find a way to make it tell a story for you. Um, what's been interesting for me in terms of this process is that sometimes it's really hard to find the data that you need. You can look at GitHub logs, you can look at internal logs, you can create internal registries and track people and track them over time and create all these systems of record, but sometimes it's still not enough. Um, I've been working on a project related to this, this line of work where I'm actively going in and interviewing people to collect more data. I'm creating forms that stick on the side of the work that they're doing. So if I can get them to click three more buttons after they've done a particular type of update, then now I have more information about how long that took them, why they did it, where that was coming from, how many teams they have to talk to in order to do that work. So I'm trying to find more creative ways to collect additional data, again, without having adding additional burden to our, our development community. Um, other, other ways to do this, um, I was talking to Bob about this a lot yesterday, mentioning Bob a lot today, I'm sad he's not in the room, um, is that this is where other types of non-software development people can add value. Say, I'm in operations. I'm not actually writing software for my company. I'm out there talking to engineers. I'm trying to help engineers improve the processes and ways that they work on technology and they work how they develop software. And so essentially everything that goes through me is also data. How many people do I have to talk to on a given basis to get a thing done? That is the kind of point of record that sometimes having other people thinking about the problem versus the people that are just doing it can see more of what's happening around it. Another thing to think about is also your time scale. Um, value attribution, especially in open source software, can be years in the making. Um, one of my favorite examples was something, let's say, we were looking at it for the Kubernetes project and we had an individual engineer submit a patch into an upstream version. But it took maybe a year to get into the project because of all the reviews and all the changes that had to be made. And then it took an even longer amount of time for that individual update to actually make it back into our product that uses Kubernetes. So they did this piece of work in one year and then a year plus later, that was actually realized in the project. And so when they were trying to explain the value in the moment, it's like, well, I did this thing, but like you're not gonna actually get any value from it for like another six months or longer. Um, so maybe we need to expand our time skills to ensure that we're actively looking at all the work that has been done and realizing and seeing the realization of that work and the impact of that work. Um, and at the end of the day, you really have to focus these arguments on what is most important to your stakeholder community because it's going to be a little bit different for everyone. Um, that's kind of it for me. I think I have maybe a minute for a question. I apologize for taking so long. I have a really short, easy question. What are your cat's names? <laughs> uh, Hopefully that's... Yes, no, that's short, great. Easy uh, this is Moby. Um, the black and white one is Newton. Um, they mostly get along. 
<laughs> Depends on the day. Uh, again, very quick one and most probably easy. Uh, thanks, it's a very good talk and it has very good references. Therefore, I would like to get your slides. <laughs> so please upload them to SCAD. I will do that. Thank you for Thank the reminder. You. I was still working on them this morning, so that's why they're not there. <laughs> okay, I think that's time. Thank you so much.